What's up, everybody? Thomas Claxton here, and you guys are tuned in to the Sitting In with Thomas Claxton podcast. This is your stop for the behind the scenes dive straight into the heart of the music industry. Here, I interview some of the world's best in multiple fields, ranging from performers to producers and engineers, manufacturer CEOs, technologists, entrepreneurs, representative firms, technicians, attorneys, CPAs, and much more to give you guys an insider's perspective. The advice, the road stories, and the insider's point of view on an industry and where its future lies. It's all right here. And remember, if you guys like what you see, like, share, and subscribe. You guys sit back and enjoy. Thanks a lot. I gotta watch it. I said, have some tact. I have know, a watch. But, yeah, but, but you know, if I'm bringing in these rock star type players, you know, some stuff's gonna come up. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just going to. So right. You got to get over that. Yeah. Video cameras rolling. All right, in five, five, four, four, three, three, two, two, one, five. Oh man, see the you threw me off. We just started again. <laughs> Ignition sequence start. Six, five. Jonathan Mover. Hello there. Yeah. So I'm, I'm here at the 2020 NAMM show. And this is the Sitting In with Thomas Claxton podcast. And when they asked me to do the podcast at the show and do it in the Gator Cases booth, I had a choice of people who I was going to call up. And uh, the first guy that I actually did ask was Jonathan Mover. Oh, thank you for that. Oh, no, dude. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate it, yeah. man. You're a, you're a heck of a talent. Always yeah, a pleasure. Heck of a guy. Oh, no. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, no worries. My mother raised me well. She did. She did, obviously. And my father. He yeah. was the talent. Oh, okay. So, yeah. so you're giving them both credit? Yeah. My father credit? was a musician. My mother was the personality. Oh, wow. Yes. Okay. And, it, and they combined. Good and combination. There you are. Yep. Right. I <laughs> got you. <laughs> so look at this, man. What do you think about all these shenanigans out here? NAMM show is great. It's overwhelming and it's exhausting, but it's always great to attend. And um, yeah, you know, thank God it's only once a year. I... Couldn't do more than that. But. Oh, well, well, this size once a year, you know. Yeah, well, for the drum stuff especially. You no, know? that's and true. In the middle of the drum hall, it can be quite fatiguing. The rest of us say, thank God, the drum stuff is once a year, too. Yeah, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, you're over there with uh, with Drumhead, not too far of a walk from here. We're in the middle of all of it. All, all the drums, literally. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. uh, there's people just banging on these drums consistently. We were talking before. I mean, last year, the DV police were shutting people down left, right, and center, but... They don't seem to be coming around much this time around, which I don't know is a good thing or a bad thing. It's it's pretty deafening over there. Well, the thing is, like, I was noticing the same thing this year. But they weren't being uh, quite as yeah. you know, strict about it. But then I watched this one guy walk up to this booth who was barely making noise out of the acoustic guitar that was coming through the system. And he was like, look, I told you to keep it down. Mm. And I'm like, oh, my God, are you, are you listening to the rest of it? I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why they pick and choose where they do, but... I don't know, yeah. I don't know. But anyway, it's always you good know. to be here. Oh, abs absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's... Uh, NAM is overwhelming, but it's also inspiring in some ways, I think. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? You know? Yeah. Great to see, you know, new gear. Great to see new and old faces. You know, it's uh, it's a good thing. Glad we have it. Well, I think so. I mean, so... How many years have you been coming to NAM? Not as not nearly as many as some other people. I mean, my first NAM show was probably five or six years ago. Eighty-seven for me. Yeah, that's a, that's a, yeah. You know, Scott Page, who I interviewed uh, on Thursday, mm -hmm. he was like, you know, he's been coming to it for God knows how many years, and I'm, just, you know, then I thought I was doing pretty good, and then I felt like that small. I was like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, yeah, well, I'm kind of a rookie at this. Then I guess yeah, it's been going for a while. But I like to think I I, I pick up things uh, pretty quickly. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't take much, you know. You've seen one, you've seen them all, but they're good to be at. Well, they kept telling me for, for the longest time in the world, dude, you need to be going to NAM. You mm -hmm. need to go to NAM. And I was like, yeah, okay. You know, but I'm glad I did, you know, because when I went to NAM, I started meeting some awesome people because it, it's a great place for networking. And right. even though it's a dealer and merchant type of situation, 
there is room for artists. Sure. You know, and um, you just have to know the right place at the right time and when the appropriate time to do things is. But yeah, there's a lot to do here. Um, we get all of our business done in the you know in the long weekend, and then just follow things up throughout the year. But it is it's impossible to do what we do anywhere else any other way. You know, it's the great thing about it. And even in four days, we're booked around the clock, and you can't get everybody. But we do get so much done. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, now, now looking at this, where do you see the future of the uh, of the business going from here? I mean, is it, is it looking promising? Grab my crystal ball. Yeah. Uh, you know. Well, you're John of the Mover. You know, you should be you know, yeah. clairvoyant. You know these things. Everything is cyclical. Everything comes around. You know, it's a roller coaster all the time. But I don't think music's ever going to go away. How people play music might go away or change you know how people perceive music might change but music's always going to be around you know as the record sales decline touring and live shows are on an upswing so you know it's but, a good there's always a good you can always find the positive in everything oh sure i mean you know i think as far as the performing live and the touring it's that that's definitely coming full circle because you know and i was listening to uh to joe lamont uh, at the NAMM breakfast a couple of days ago, and he was talking about how, you know, back before there was recorded things, and, you know, people were strictly going out and performing, and that was what it was, you know, before we ever sure. started recording music, and now it's swinging back to where that's how artists are making their living again, you know, make, going out and playing, and, and that's when you're finding out who the real musicians are, in my It opinion. is, yeah, yeah, there's no yeah. doubt about it. Um, but it's, I think the biggest shift with that is playing live is great. I mean, you know, I do a lot of studio work, but there's nothing better than playing in front of an audience. But the, uh, the income that you get from playing live uh, will never match what you get from the sales and mechanicals and publishing in a successful band. So I don't know that uh, the music industry and how to make a living in it uh, is ever going to come back to the way it was before, you know, but it is what it is. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. So, um, so you are the owner of Drumhead Magazine. Yes. And I would easily say probably the most respected drum magazine out there in the industry today. And uh, tell me about that, man. How did you uh, did you acquire Drumhead? And um, I got approached almost 15 years ago by a German book and ma music book and magazine publisher who wanted to establish himself in the U.S. And so um, we met up in New York. Uh, I didn't know why he was, quote unquote, interviewing me at dinner. He knew who I was. And uh, just, you know, what do you like about drum magazines? And I basically said, nothing. I don't read them anymore. <laughs> aside from not being a lot of interesting information in there, once I turned pro and I really started to see the, you know, the ins and outs of the industry, a lot of what was reported in the magazines that were out there wasn't necessarily the truth or, you know, the real picture of what goes on. So, you know, eventually said, uh, well, if you could have your own magazine, what would you do? And I said, I would have it written by pros only um, to really tell the truth about the industry, good and bad. Mm -hmm. uh, it should be long form. You know, you don't interview somebody for 15 minutes and do three pages. You know, you interview them for a couple of hours and you do 20 pages. Right. And, you know, a bunch of other things. And I left it at that. He contacted me again shortly after and said, uh, I want to start a publishing company in America and I want to launch it with a drum magazine. Are you interested? And I said, no. I said, I'm <laughs> not a publisher. Well, I it down. I'm not an editor in chief. Uh, I read a lot of books, but, you know, no, I'll give you my idea and you can pay me for my concept. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, and he started the company. He started interviewing people for the editor in chief position. Uh, he spoke to people from Time Magazine, from the New York Times, from a bunch of different places, and kept on calling me back and saying, I don't think anybody has the vision and can do what I know you can do. So he's based outside of Munich. So I just said to him, fly me over to Germany. Let me spend a week in your facility. I want to meet every person that runs every division and show me how to make a magazine from day one to the end, you know, from the beginning to print. And at the end of my stay, I'll tell you that I want to do it or I'll find somebody to do it for you. Sure. And I did that. I spent about five days with them. I went through the entire process from the text to the copywriting to the copy editing to the art to the layout design. And uh, at the end of the week, I said, uh, I can do it. I'll give you a shot. I'll give it a shot. 
So that was the beginning. Um, he funded everything uh, generously, and we got off to a great start. Uh, business didn't necessarily go the way that he wanted it to go, and it didn't take uh, but you know a few years. And by different channels, I ended up the 100% sole owner of the magazine, and now we're the number one drum magazine. Period, and that's uh, doing very very well. So you basically you, you took the step forward. You never look back. Never look back. No. Yeah, that's that's uh, you know that's important. You know that first step. I think um, I talked to a lot of. Uh, aspiring people in the business you know now whether they want to be performers or whether they want to get into you know the stuff behind the scenes or whatnot and sometimes they get to a place when they don't know what to do next and I tell people all the time take a risk yeah um, I mean as long as it's something that you know that you feel like you're pretty and, confident with and you have interest in it the funny thing about me is the only thing I ever wanted to do in my life was music play drums studio tour you know eventually that led to producing and, and engineering but I only ever pursued drums and music. The magazine was something that was handed to me, Do you, you know, and I said, yeah, I'll take a shot, I'll make it work. Same thing with the studio. I never dreamed of owning, I owned Skyline Studios in New York City for 17 years. It was one of New York's biggest studios. Everybody from Steely Dan and Madonna to Shakira, Eric Clapton, Bowie, David Byrne. Wow. We had everybody in there, Placido Domingo, Billy Joel. As soon as you said Steely Dan, I was hooked. Yeah. And <laughs> what a great it, band. Unbelievable. And uh, it was another thing that fell in my lap. Uh, the short story of that is back in the late 80s, I was um, very lucky to be involved in a, in a music project from South Africa that was one of the first bands to do a full tour of the Soviet Union when it was still shut down in Soviet. And uh, one thing led to another. I ended up meeting some, a lot of Russian people. And uh, I started going back and forth and producing and playing on records and working with a bunch of different Soviet artists. And then when the Iron Curtain opened up, some of the guys that I was working with ended up coming into some real money. Rubles were now worth dollars. And they called me up and they said, um, we love what we're doing with you. We want to do a real full-blown studio. And I said, great, you should rent a house in Long Island, get a four ADATs with a Mackie 30 channel, 32 channel board, and you can send a Russian band over, they can live at the house and record. They said, no, we want to do a real studio. And I had you know, already been doing sessions at Skyline for years. Um, Skyline was owned, you know, operated by Nile Rogers and a bunch of other people, and, but it, it had gone under, they had vacated. So I called the landlord, went to take a look at it, and called them in Moscow the next day, and said one of the best studios in New York is vacant. They said, we'll take it, we took it, and they folded. I was a silent partner with them for about three or four years, and the Russian way of business didn't really work in New York City at the time. I, and, I suppose not. <laughs> and they went under, and I was left standing with it. So I never wanted to do a studio, ended up with Skyline, never wanted to do a magazine, ended up with Drumhead, and now I'm out here, and aside from the magazine, I also own Champion Sight and Sound, which is... Two, yeah, tell me about Champion. It's two buildings. The initial... Um, thought was to bring Skyline out here, which I did. I brought all my gear out with me. But I ended up uh, in a situation now with a former partner who went bankrupt and didn't make it. And now I'm the 100% sole owner of this. And we have film stages and sound stages, event production and management, distribution, um, recording studio, producer suites, backline rentals. We do literally a bit of everything in, uh, in audio and video and film and TV. We got two buildings. One's in Atwater Village, and one is up in Van Nuys. And uh, that's again, never wanted to own that either. But it was a business opportunity that I said I'll take part in, and the other person failed, and I just ended up with it. Oh, it seems to me like you've had a lot of great stuff. You know, you 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 uh, you're handed opportunities, and you're one of those guys who just you know takes it, makes the most out of it. I like a challenge, and sure. I like to learn about new things, you know. I didn't know anything about event production before I got into this, and now I do. I didn't know anything about publishing before I got into the magazine world, and now I do. And uh, so, you, so you learned as you went along. Yeah, had see, to. See, oh, yeah, and, and that's another thing that I found, you know, a lot of people think that you have to already previously be an expert at something in order to to work a business with something, and that's not necessarily true. You know, you can you can know enough yeah. and learn as you go. You know, because you never stop learning. I mean, technically, right? You I know, do, you have to have common sense and you know some some amount of smarts. You know, I mean, <laughs> really, uh, to take it in and learn learn about everything. 
And I'm the type of person a lot of times that I like to keep my mouth shut and just watch what's going on around me and learn from what other people are doing. If they do it right, then I learn the right way. If they do it wrong, I watch them fail and I learn the right way. That's one of the things I noticed about you when I first met you. Yeah. I learned to watch your eyes. Yeah. Because uh, was I looking at babes. Uh, oh, dude, <laughs> babes, or you know, look, there was all you were looking all around the room, yeah. and I could tell when Jonathan Mover had red flagged something. It was you just had this look in your face, like you know, it's like it's, it's like uh, it's something a, about what was just said, or something about that, or some action just piqued Mover's interest it's in some way. It's important to assess everything. It really is. You it, know? No, it's so true. Yeah. Too many people run blindly into things. and uh, yeah. You don't, don't always get a second chance. No, so. no, that, that's 100% true. Yeah. See, you know, I always knew you as Mover. Mm -hmm. you as know, most people do. Right. So when Alan Friedman, you know, a little backstory about here how Mover and I met, um, there was an event that we that we were going to do. Uh, Crystal Morris from Gator Cases, uh, myself, an attorney named Ron Beanstock, and Alan Friedman, the CPA, well-known guy. Uh, Alan and Ron will be guests on an upcoming episode here of the podcast. But the four of us were going to do this event at the Hard Rock Cafe in Nashville during Summer Nam, and Alan just kept telling me, "Oh well, we got to get a drummer." And I was like, yeah, of course, you know, because Ron and Alan and I were going to put a band together to play at this event. And he kept saying, let me call Jonathan. Let me call Jonathan. That's all he kept saying. You I was, didn't know who. I had no clue he was talking about, you know. So I'm like, I'm like, oh, God, you know, who in the hell is this guy going to bring on the phone? Could have been Jonathan Moffat. It could have been. Could have been I, lucky. I, I, You know, but I just <laughs> kept, I kept, it was like anticipation. And I'm yeah. like, finally, I asked him, I said, dude. Which Jonathan are you calling? Do I know this guy? Because I figured, you know, it's Alan. He's a CPA, hell of a musician, but he's going to call up some guy who's in a cubicle down the hallway named Jonathan or something. I had no idea he was going to call. And he goes, oh, it's my good buddy, Jonathan Mover. But it, he must have called some other Jonathans first because, remember, you called me, he called me one or two days before the show. I it, flew out last no, minute. No, he didn't. I, I mean, he did call you one or two days before, but he... He, I think he, he was, exhausted all the other Jonathans. I, I just think the left he was left. so confident that he could get Jonathan Mover yeah. that he was like, you know, I'll, I'll call him eventually. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and sure enough, it, we got to the, like the last minute, and he goes, all right. I said, you talked to Mover, and he goes, he goes, uh, not yet. <laughs> I'm like, well, don't you think the man needs to know that he's playing this weekend if he even can? Alan knows that he has me dangling <laughs> by a string. Yeah. You he's, know? he's saved me so much, you know, from the IRS that whatever he does, I whatever he asks for, I'll do. He told me, he goes, oh, don't worry about a thing. I got this. <laughs> and, and, and you know what? Ever since then, I, I never doubted Alan Friedman because I was sitting there thinking, I was like, holy hell, it didn't hit me until like... A, you know, when we got in the rehearsal room, I was sitting there like, hell yeah, I'm playing with Jonathan Mover. This is cool. Uh, uh, you're kind. No, man. I mean, you know, because I remember, I remember being, a, you know, I was still am, but big fan of Satriani. Mm. That was good stuff, man. Mm. You know, so, and you were with Satriani for on the road for quite a while. I mean. Yeah, we did 10 years. Elaborate on that a little bit. 10, ten years. and We met at a NAMM show, actually, <laughs> at... Uh, I'm pretty sure January of 87 was my first NAMM show. It could have been the year before, but summer of 86, 87. 86, 87, what's the difference? Yeah. Summer of 87, <laughs> uh, Hoshino, Tama, that I was playing at the time, uh, they had signed me, they had signed Steve Vai, and they had signed this unknown guy, Joe Satriani. So um, I was still living in London at the time, but they flew me into their facility in Ben Salem outside of uh, Philadelphia. Sure. So I spent my day, you know, in the drum part of the factory and going through drums and talking to everybody. And this other, you know, rock and roll looking guy with long hair, he had hair at the time. Oh, and, so he, uh, he was a ball back then? No, no, no. no. <laughs> Black leather jacket. And he was with the guitar guys all day. At the end of the day, um, I was waiting for my drum guys to go to dinner. He was waiting for his guitar guys to go to dinner. And we were in the front foyer area together. And he just happened to say, you know, who are you? What are you doing here? He had heard of me because I had played with GTR, with the guitar players from Yes and Genesis. And uh, he introduced himself. And then he said, um, I'm playing at the Summer NAMM show in a couple of weeks with Steve Vai, and I need a drummer. Would you be up for playing? And I was supposed to go back to London. 
But I said, yeah, sure, I'll you know hang with my family in Massachusetts and I'll see you in Chicago. So I flew out to Chicago. We met about a half an hour before we played uh, with Joe and Steve and a few other people sat in with us. And at the end of the gig, I just said, nice meeting, and I split. I didn't even hang out to, you know. Done. Yeah. One, one and yeah. over. Yeah. <laughs> I had a, a friend of mine, female friend in, in Chicago that I was going to have a drink with. And that was the end of it. I didn't think much more. And a couple of months later, he called back and said, Hoshina would like, to go to, uh, would like us to go to play the Tokyo Music Fair. Are you up for a week in Japan? I said, yeah. And I'm pretty sure while we were there playing, Surfing with the Alien came out because it was already recorded. Phenomenal. Yeah, and it hit like the top 200 or something. First instrumental record to hit the, the top 200 since I think Jeff Beck's Blow by Blow. Wow. And uh, by the time we got back and a few weeks went by, it turned into a tour and another tour. And 10 years later and two or three records with him. And it was a great, great hang. And... Uh Correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, you're wrong. I am. I might be. There's a, there's a good chance in that. I'm flying blind today with with Mover huh? because uh, all the other guests I had on here, I took a few notes. I won't leave you hanging. That's you know, okay. you know. So yeah. I was like, you know, I think I know Mover well enough. Yeah. Got him. Got him kind of figured out now, or do I? You never know. Well, I'll correct you if you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. Let me know. So uh, so, but you were also on stage with Stu Ham. Yeah. You know, yeah. and uh, yeah, we started out as the quote unquote Satriani trio. And, uh, and then we went into some different configurations. Um, most of the time was the trio, but we also toured with one of Joe's friends, Jeff Campitelli, was playing rhythm guitar and a little bit of drums, and I was doubling on keyboards on that tour. And then we did a really great tour for Time Machine, which had Phil Ashley on keyboards. Oh, wow. And that was one of my favorite tours, because Phil's an amazing keyboardist and He's a great incredible. guy. Loved hanging with him. And, and it kind of, on the first two Satriani tours, surfing with the alien and then flying in a blue dream even though I was playing giant kit and small kit I was triggering on two octopads and a bunch of samplers I was playing all of the keyboards rhythm guitar arpeggios um, some of the percussion uh, you know hitting the sound effects so on half of the night it was left hand on you know on the electronics right hand on the kit and I loved the challenge of doing that but there wasn't a lot of freedom because I was tied into playing this fourth person part when we got Phil on board, it gave me this incredible freedom and a whole new way to look at the gig because I didn't have to think about one hand has to go onto this and one hand has to be here. There, I could just focus on playing drums. But yeah, uh, you know, and Stu, he was there from the beginning. Incredible bass player. Great bass yeah. player. Stu's we had a best. lot of fun. I'll bet. Got into some, you know, I would have loved to be a fly on the wall in some of those rooms. Yeah. You, Joe, and Stu. Yeah. What the hell could have come up in those conversations? You know, well, if you talk to Joe about it sometimes, he wasn't always pleased. We, we were a handful, me and Stu, and I say oh, that in a, in a loving way. Uh, we, we drove Joe a little crazy sometimes, but it was all good. We, we had our 30th anniversary um, a few years ago. And so you got to see Joe? Yeah, the summer of, of uh, 2017. We got together for a week and a few dates up in Monterey, which was 30 years from the release of uh, Surfing with the Alien, and it was great. It was a wonderful reunion. Oh, and, that's you know, awesome. Yeah, we keep in touch. Was Stu there that night? Yeah, it was the three of us. We got oh, back that, together, that's and incredible. we jammed with uh, Paul Gilbert, came up on stage, and Phil Collin from uh, Def Leppard played with us. Wow. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, Def Leppard going Tommy back on the Emmanuel. road pretty soon. Oh, yeah, yeah. Tommy Emmanuel. Yeah, he came up and did some blues tunes with us, and he's from another world. Tommy... Literally one of the most inspirational uh, acoustic guitarists yeah. that I, that I've ever seen. Um, he, uh, you know, a testament to the guy he is because he'll play small venues too. Just if he feels like it's the kind of gig that he wants to do, he'll go out mm -hmm. and do it. He doesn't care if it's a huge place or a small place. Right. And uh, there's a place about 15 minutes from my house, not a very enormous place, but uh, holds about 100 150 people. And he was there one night. Just hanging out with those 150 people. Cool. Yeah, he, you know, he not was, because he couldn't book, uh, book a 15,000. Sure. He just plays because he, he loves to play. That's right, and yeah. that's that's the kind of musician I like. You know, yeah, that's uh, it's what did it for him. You know, and, and when you go back to uh, a lot of the guys that you've played with, and some of the ladies that you played with as well, mm -hmm. your list. You mean like Alice Cooper? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to tell him you, you called him that. But, uh, I've called him worse. He's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Alice is a real chilled guy, too. Right. But, I mean, you, you know, the list is, in my opinion, like, you, it's like incomparable. I mean, you, you wow. can't really touch that list. I mean, because you've got guys, whether it was, um, you know, 
through uh, through studio work or production or something or performing, whatever it was, you got guys on there and, and girls like Alice Cooper and Aretha Franklin. You, I mean, I saw Mick Jagger, you know, Elton John. I mean, these are some major names, you know, that you've had the privilege of working with in some capacity in your career. And it was a privilege, and I'm I'm really lucky. Oh, I'd say. I mean, was, you know, that's that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. No complaints. It's uh, oh, sorry. That's it's sorry. nice it because it's been very diverse, and that's what has been the most fun. You know, again, playing with Aretha Franklin at one point, and then Alice Cooper couldn't be two that's more two different extreme worlds. opposites. You know, and Shakira, Julian Lennon. It's been it's fun. I love a challenge. And Julian Lennon, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when did you work with Julian? Um. I did, uh, he did a tribute to Lucy, uh, Lucy in the Sky, Lucy Bottom, yeah. when she passed away, and I did the, the drums for that and a few other tracks with him uh, in New York. I guess that was probably about uh, eight or ten years ago. I always uh, thought his music didn't get enough appreciation. You know, he was so like his dad that he couldn't escape it. He's amazing to work with, incredibly right on talented. Right double look. I mean, he... Yeah, it looked like John too, but... There were moments in the studio when I was working with him where he would sing something or say something. And sounded like him. Just like John Lennon. Crazy. And sometimes he sounded like Paul, too. It was pretty weird. <laughs> but super nice guy and, and a pleasure to work with him. Um, but yeah, you know. My but, favorite song of his was uh, Salt Water. Mm -hmm. That was a great tune. And yeah. I, I think he, he, Valat was a big song. Yeah, you know, that, a great record. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, now let's get on to Alice, though. Mm -hmm. you know, so how many times did he decapitate a ten, a ten foot tall Frankenstein while you were there? Um, did that happen? On we, we did Frankenstein on the, <laughs> on the first. Uh, the last time I played with him was about six years, seven years ago, and he was doing Frankenstein again, but it wasn't decapitation. Um, <laughs> but in when my first tour with Alice was '89, and we were decapitating him at that time. He was getting into the guillotine, and I love the dead, and we chop off his head every night. And, Amazing. Yeah. Alice was incredible to work with. Not only was I a huge fan of his music growing up, and I saw him when I was a little kid, but he, everything he does is for the audience. He's oh absolutely God. amazing. Every single night, no matter how he feels, how tired, it's 100% it's on. Every person in that audience is, is equally important to him. And I, I respect him immensely for how he treats you know, his live show and, and what he does. It's and one of the best shows in rock and roll. It, it is. And if not the best. And he's so great to work with. He's so great to hang with. Um, not only is he incredibly funny and really smart funny. We're talking serious, intelligent humor, which I love. Um, he's also a walking encyclopedia of everything. You know? And we were, I mean, I play golf. Not like Alice. But we would play 18 holes in the morning, do a 90 minute gig at night. I mean, what, what kind of tour is better than that? And you know, we'd be out there on the golf course and he'd say, oh yeah, man, and start telling stories about when he was hanging out with the Rat Pack. He's got stories about, you know, him and Johnny Carson, him and Frank Sinatra. Everybody knows Alice Cooper. Absolutely incredible. And, and everybody respects Alice oh, Cooper. Oh, absolutely. I've never heard anyone in the business yeah. say one bad He's thing about Alice. Smart, smart guy. You know, and, and uh, I, the thing I hear most about Alice is the fact that, you know, everybody's kind of shocked of what he's like in real life. Mm -hmm. For some reason, they think this guy is going to be running around, you know, like crazy or something when well, he's he, off stage. Well, he but did it at one point. At one point, I, you know, sure. He, he'll be the first to admit that. But today. Oh, no, he's you know, sharp as he's, attack and dead on it and... And again, very, very conserved, and uh, you know, going out playing golf and yeah. things like that. It's it's absolutely hilarious. Scratch golfer, the guy's unbelievable. I remember the uh, the first time that I that I went to see one of his shows. It was um, I, I think it was at the one of the theaters in Jacksonville, Florida, if I'm not mistaken. And um, I went out there, and I'm watching this entire thing, and I knew all about Alice's music. I was a big fan, even especially in the early days and mm -hmm. that stuff, and. You know, one of my favorite tunes is Only Women Bleed. Yep. You know, great song. First so, tour of his I saw was Welcome to My Nightmare. Yeah, yeah. So, I, so I'm out there watching this, but I, and I knew it was a great show because a lot of the big shows in rock have all said that they were inspired by Alice. And, oh, yeah. You know, he, he was theater rock. Right, it was, right, exactly. You know, so you go out there and you hear the guys from Kiss and all those guys saying, you know, we, yeah. we learned a lot from Alice Cooper. And so I couldn't wait to see this show. Yeah. And, um, so I get out there, and the next thing you know, literally this 10-foot-tall Frankenstein comes running across the stage, and I think from that point on I was shell-shocked. Right. 
and the, the whole thing just it was like a big immersive experience <laughs> you know and uh, I think he brought the guillotine out that night you know yeah. and uh, it was just it was just one incredible uh, incredible night you know so I, I gotta go back and see Alice again pretty soon uh, he, and he's he's as great today as he was you know 10 years ago and 15 years ago and I, I started playing with him the first time in 89 yeah and he was amazing back then now how long were you on the road with Alice again? Uh, I did part of the trash tour, and then I went back with Satriani to do the rest of Flying in a Blue Dream. Sure. And then I went back. Alice calls me whenever he has a drummer problem. Well, you're the guy to call. Pretty much. And that's why I <laughs> get to work with a lot of different people, but I don't have long careers with them, which is fine. So, so you, have your, Al you got your own stuff going on. Yeah, but I mean, you know, Alice needed me for, you know, uh, four months a few years ago. I went out and did it, no problem. Aretha, I ended up with her for about four and a half years, but... You know, I, I loved getting the last minute call like I did with the Genesis Tribute Band sure. last year. You got a call on a Tuesday night to be on stage Wednesday night and no rehearsals. I, I love that stuff. Same well, thing with records. I I love the challenge of going in and nailing it. Well, you're, you're passionate about what you do, hmm. which is important. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's a lot of guys, um, I think they get into music for the wrong reasons sometimes, you know. they. They see the glitz and the glamour sure. and the fame and the money and things like that, and they think, oh, that's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. You know, but the ones who really go far are the ones who have an, a real passion for what it is that they're actually doing. Yeah. Playing you know? music is the cake. The glitz, oh, yeah. if it comes, and the babes, and the, the money, if it comes, is all icing on the cake. But Absolutely. Just being able to play music for my whole life is a bigger gift than I could have ever asked for. And everybody says that across yeah. the board. It's you know? true. It's, uh, it's awesome. And unless you live it, you don't really understand it. Yeah. You know, right. I've, I've had so many people look at me and tell me, you know, you, you got to be crazy when you're going to grow up and get a real job mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. Right. And I'm like, and you just, you don't get it. Yeah. That's okay. Yep. You know, go back to your job, do what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Leave me alone. Let, you know, leave me in my world. It's funny back in the old, in the high school days before I moved to London, you know, it was, it was shell shock when I'd show up on a date, you know, hair down on my ass. And I was already, <laughs> I already had earrings in both ears and everything. And there were lots of parents that raised their eyebrows when I was at the door waiting to take out their daughter. Um, but, you know, it wasn't long after that because I kept in touch with all of my exes and my friends. And, Did you scare people? Oh, yes. Did you scare yes. plenty of parents? But, you know, come back from London a few years later and say hello again. And everybody was very happy and proud at that point. But See, yeah. they, they, they love those musicians when they're famous and successful. Yeah. But and then it's like, oh, my God, you're bringing him home? Uh -huh. Not you know? with my daughter. I got that. I, <laughs> I respect that. <laughs> I respected all of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember my, my ex-wife, I, uh, I went, remember meeting her parents for the first time. And I drove all the way to Boston to go up there and meet the parents. My hometown. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Your neck of the woods. Yeah. In Dorchester. Uh -huh. I'm Peabody. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. You know, so I drive up there and I, I meet the dad and everything. Old school Italian guy, right off the boat. Yeah, Dorchester I mean, was tough. Oh man, yeah. that, that, I think that was the biggest challenge of my life at the moment. You know, because <laughs> yeah. man, well, he, you succeeded though. I, I did succeed. Yeah. You know, and it, you know, he probably hates my guts this day because notice I said ex-wife, but mm -hmm. that's okay. It's all right. Yeah, you know, things change. Things change. It happens. Yeah. You know, but um, but yeah, believe me, that whole uh, Fabrizio was in here yesterday, and um, Fabrizio Grossi, and we were having this conversation about the Italian culture and mm -hmm. you know just how serious that is taken right. within that culture and I was like oh I get it I get it you don't have to explain you it you lived me, it bro. I lived <laughs> it you know but um, so you know I, I put this pod, podcast together this this iPod, this iPod. iPod. Yeah. I'm telling you that show my age everybody what are you doing at two o'clock I got to do this iPod recording it's like yeah I like, knew it was oh, called the God. podcast I just it's okay. Yeah. You know, anyway, I'll forgive you for but that. But you put together this podcast. Yeah, when I was putting it together, I was thinking, you know, what I want out of this is not only the performers, you know, the guys who are at the actual shows that are visible, but I wanted the behind the scenes stuff as well. Mm -hmm. You know, the guys who know a lot about the business side of it, you know, the ones who are doing the producing. That's why I'm bringing in Ron and Alan later on, you know, because I want the lawyers, I want the accountants. There's a whole section of this industry that turns the gears that people are not even aware of because all they know is what they see or what they're listening to and that's it they have no idea what all is going on behind the scenes well it's it's called the music business that's right and most people don't really pay attention to the business part and and speaking as a drummer because most drummers are not melodic players 
so they're not writing the music in the band. They don't get publishing. Um, you know, I've even heard drummers are not musicians. Somebody some people do. Somebody say that. told me that one time. Yeah. I was like, eh, we, we're, okay. we're the bottom of the totem pole and proud of it. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, there are very few drummers out there. Seriously, unless you're a singing drummer like Phil Collins who can write a pop tune, or you're a Stuart Copeland that happens to play in a band with Sting and the Police, one of my favorites, or God rest his soul, Neil Parrott, who also oh. played in a massive band, or. You know, uh, I was Alex devastated Van, when we lost Neil. Yeah, yeah everybody was. is, and Alex Van Halen, who's got a you know, who's, amazing, who's the brother of the greatest rock guitar player. I mean, unless you're lucky to be in a situation like that, you might have a few great years of playing drums with somebody, but it's the guitar player that wrote the tunes that makes all the money. It's the lead singer that did all the deals. Um, you know, e even across the board, back in the years when endorsements paid a lot of money, you know, a big guitar player would get, you know, a quarter of a million bucks a year. Half a million dollars to sign with a company. What drummers get? A drum kit. A drum kit. And, may, and maybe, you know, <laughs> ten clinics for a thousand bucks each. No, and, no and money. No, they didn't sweeten the pot with the kit whatsoever. You're laughing about it, and we are laughing about it, but it's true. So, oh, wow. you know, if you, if you don't really learn how the industry works and, and know how to guide yourself accordingly, have fun while you can, but when the fun ends, you're going to be in trouble. You guys should have protested that, totally. Well, you know. They'd cough it up, write the check or I'm putting the sticks down. But it makes sense, <laughs> because when you look at a school like Berkeley College of Music, which I think is 70% guitar players, you know, it makes sense. It does. You it, know? It's a supply and demand type of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so as long as you know what you're getting into, you know how to get what you, can, what you need out of it. And I just don't think a lot of people, you they know, don't learn that side of it. No way. All right. And that, that's why, you know, uh, that's one reason why I called you, not only because of the drumming, but you're, you're an entrepreneur. I mean, you've, you've taken these, uh, these opportunities that we were talking about earlier, you picked them up and you ran with them, and you showed that there are other ways to make a living in this industry. Oh, There sure. are other things you can do, other things yeah. you can, you know, that will, that will tie in with your artistic expression. They all cross collateral. They really do. You know, owning Skyline, there were many records I played on because the artist was in there working and the drummer didn't work out or the drummer didn't show or uh, they wrote a new tune on the spot. And you know, you remember, you know, Vanessa Carlton? Yeah. You know, she was in, in Skyline doing a, a writing session and they needed drums and I was there. So, you know, one thing leads to another. And uh, yeah, just ha have to always be open to opportunity. And luck has a lot to do with it, but I believe you can find your luck. You know, you can't sit back and wait for your phone to ring, but you know, you can go out there and make your luck happen. Oh, absolutely. Well, that's what it's all about. Don't sit around and wait for that. You can't. You know, because if, if that's what you're doing, good luck to right. you. Especially you know? in this day and age with social media and. You know, everybody with a laptop is a producer, and everybody with an iPhone now can be on uh, on YouTube and selling themselves. It's incredible. Yeah. You know, you brought up Stuart Copeland earlier, mm -hmm. and I remember the first time I spoke with Stuart, I had a, you know, 10-minute conversation with him one day, and it was at NAMM. As a mm -hmm. matter of fact, he was here about, uh, I think it was 2015, maybe, mm -hmm. give or take, he was doing a speech or something, and, and I got a chance to talk with him, and he said, you know, that these days, the business is back into the hands of of the artist more so than it has been in some years past because back then artists were at the mercy of the labels right you know whereas now an artist can go out do something decent quality push a button and somebody in Tokyo can see it in five seconds and you don't need somebody to necessarily you know give you the green light you can kind True. of you can kind of take the wheel and go with it in some in some ways. I yeah, mean, I mean, I think it's all kind of in ratio. Yeah, um, there are definitely people that have been discovered because they did it on their own that probably never would have had never. an A and R guy who doesn't know anything about music signing them. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, there's so much shit out <laughs> there that we're all saturated with now. Um, but there are very few artists still that aren't signed to a major label or have some type of a juggernaut behind them that are going to get as big as a Beyonce or an Ed Sheeran or Billie Eilish, you know, any of these artists now that are massive, they've got big, big money behind them. It's, I, I, I'm sure there are some artists out now that I'm not familiar with, but back 20, 30 years ago, the only artist I can think of who did it on her own very successfully and and was not on a major label called all her own shots was Ani DeFranco 
you know, I don't know if you're familiar with her, but... I've heard the name. Yeah, I mean, she's amazing. She is, you know, a guitar player, singer, wrote her own road to, you know, to victory and put out all her own records. Well, that's inspirational. The world. Absolutely. But, again, back in the day, there was only one Ani DeFranco. Uh, there, were, there were no other artists selling hundreds of thousands of records and selling out theaters around the world that didn't have a major label behind them. So I do agree that... We are living in a day and age where anybody can get something out there and you don't necessarily need to be signed to Sony to be seen and heard by people, but you still need something really big behind you or some amazing fluke for you to, you know, to get an audience as big as the people we're talking about. So to those aspiring musicians that are trying to do what they're, you know, trying to break into the business somehow, everybody's looking for, you know, that, that opportunity. You got any great advice for them? I mean, what, what would you say to these to these guys, you know? I mean, seriously, guys you know, girls. do it because you love it and don't expect anything more than, you know, the love from your audience back for what you're doing. And, you know, be prepared for a long road. I'm, I've always said to people, if you could offer me a million dollars in one year or a hundred grand for ten years, I'd take the hundred grand a year for ten years. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's one of the sadder side of, uh, of the industry these days is you get these people that make it so big off of one record and it's not even a mature record no. and then they have nothing to give you two years later and they're gone when you look at all the bands that we love I mean you know we talked about Neil before and we're talking about Stuart Copeland how many years did it take for them to get some type of recognition on on a record Fail at the Kings was probably the first kind of breakthrough that Rush had the cult people knew them you know 2112, Chris of Steel, Fly By Night, but they didn't really start playing theaters until, um, uh, what did I just say, Fail With The Kings. Yeah. And the same thing with, you know, with the police. It wasn't until Zenyatta Mandata when they really, you know, kind of broke with some big stuff. And that was years. That's the spirit of radio, Tom Sawyer type stuff. You That's know, even was, later. Right, later yeah, on, right. was, you know, in that, arenas. Yeah, that was arenas. And right. so you're talking, you know, 12, 15 years. And that's the way it should be. Then you get a nice long career. You get a great following that will listen and buy everything you want. I mean, you know, when I was into a band growing up, I bought every record, you know. I own Love Beach by ELP. That's right. Okay? I own Tomato. But yes, and those were the two worst selling records of both, of both <laughs> bands' careers. But I bought them because I was into it. I wanted everything and I wanted to see Might them. Might have been the worst selling, but still good stuff. Yeah, there's still great I mean. stuff on it, you know. But... Um, yeah, you know, you don't see a lot of that anymore. And I think part of that is also because the artist isn't around long enough to develop that. So it's me again. That's okay. You're a popular guy. Yeah, well, Ze Zeppelin tune playing, so it's always good. Oh, I've got, um, which one's on play? I think YYZ is playing on my, uh, no. when people listen to my ring back. I've got the Wonton song. Oh, man, yeah. I love it, love yeah. it. So, um, it's been an awesome time having you no, here in the podcast. I know we. I know you said we got to wrap it up here at around three o'clock or so. So that's my lunch date call. Oh no, uh, man, you can't turn that down then. But uh, Jonathan Mover, you are amazing, and I do appreciate you being on the sitting in with Thomas Claxton podcast. Yeah. Here we got to give a nice shout out to Gator Cases for these awesome new uh, podcast stands that yep. they are displaying here at the show, and Great a big company. shout out to uh, Sure Microphones for the SM7B. That's right. <laughs> I, lo I love this. Uh, Show the gator. This alligator is like, what? What you want? You want some of this? Mm -hmm. I love it. So I uh, do appreciate you being here, though. My pleasure. Thanks, Thanks a lot, man. Me. And, uh, you know, uh, tell the people where they can find uh, a little more information about you, some of your music, stuff like that. Oh, everything is online. Online? You got the, uh, got the JonathanMover.com? Jonathan Actually, no. Somebody stole it from me. Somebody stole Yes, it? I lost my name. What a piece of shit. Yeah, literally. You know, like they send you a, an email every year to renew. Yeah. And a, the, the company GoDaddy or whoever I was with subbed it out to another company. No. So it went into my spam. And, and I never got the notice. And now they're, now they're wanting. And now some guy in Singapore wants like 5000 bucks for my name. And I told him, <laughs> you can have my name. You can have it. I'm not worth 5000 But yeah, I mean, you know, Wikipedia. You just Google me. It's there. Drumhead, drumheadmag.com. Champion.biz. There you go. Yeah, yeah. It's all out there. It's all out there, man. Well, thanks a lot again. Do Thank appreciate you. you being here, man. My Have pleasure. a great day. You too.